things we can learn from history if we simply take the time to read history. Um, so I've been exploring this whole topic and this whole connection of the parallels between the times in which St. Joan of Arc lived and what her role was and our times and the future prophecies and how they are similar, the similarities, the differences, and quite frankly, um, how her mission historically is caused to believe that she can help in heaven through her intercession with our current situation and also the future. So this is a book called Joan of Arc by Helen Castor. And this is the first chapter and I think you're going to get a kick out of it. So I wanted to share. The first chapter is called This War Accursed of God. God has spoken. That at least was what the English said. In the circumstances, it was hard for the French to argue, or rather it would have been had they not been too busy arguing among themselves. Hmm. For the English, it was simple. Their king's claim to the throne of France, and for that matter, his dynasty's contested right to wear the crown of England, had been utterly, gloriously vindicated by his astonishing victory at the battle they called Agincourt. Only God's will could explain how so few Englishmen had van vanquished so many great knights of France and how it was that so little English blood had been spilled when so much death had been visited on their adversaries. This was heaven's mandate in action, the triumph of another David over the might of an arrogant Goliath. As one of the royal chaplains who had formed the spiritual corps of the English army now solemnly noted in his accounts of the campaign, these clerical conscripts had sat behind the English lines as the fighting raged, praying furiously for divine intervention, and its undeniable manifestation in that mounds of pity and blood in which the French had fallen could lead to only one conclusion. Far be it from our people to ascribe the triumph to their own glory or strength, wrote the anonymous priest with palpable fervor. Rather, let it be ascribed to God alone for whom is every victory, lest the Lord be wrathful at our ingratitude and at another time turn from us, which heaven forbid his victorious hands. Clearly, the English king was waging a just war. He had given his French subjects every chance to acknowledge his rightful claim to be their ruler by descent from the French mother of his royal ancestor, Edward III. Outside the walls of Harflower, allowing the prescription for the conduct of righteous war, I'm sorry, following the prescription for the conduct of righteous war laid down in the Old Testament book of Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy, he had patiently explained that he came in peace, if only they would open the gates and submit to his authority as their duty demanded. Their obstinate refusal meant that he had no choice but to take up the sword of justice to punish their rebellion. In doing so, he was explained explained his chaplain, in doing so, he was, explained his chaplain, the true elect of God, our gracious king, his own soldier, at the head of an army that, thanks to the king's stern instructions, conduct, conducted itself soberly and piously without resorting to pillage or indulging in vengeful or wanton violence. The exposition of this analysis by the anonymous royal chaplain in his Gesta Henrici Quinto, Quinti, the deeds of Henry V, was intended in part to persuade an international audience of the merits of the king's cause, specifically the great council of the church then meeting in the German city of Constance. There was also a domestic con consti constituency that needed reminding of the imperative to lend practical support to Henry's divinely sanctioned project. The representatives of English boroughs and shires in Parliament and the representatives of the English church in convocation whose responsibility it was to assent to the taxes that would pay for the king's future campaigns in France. But heaven's judgment had been made so plain that it seemed a source of irritation in some quarters at least, that such campaigns would have to be fought at all. The Bishop of Winchester... England's Chancellor in his opening address to the Parliament that gathered in March 1416 noted testily that God had in fact already spoken three times over, 
Once in England's great naval victory over the French, French fleet at Sluice in 1340, then 1356 when Francis King had been captured at Poitiers and now on the killing field of Agincourt. Oh God, remarked the royal chaplain as he recounted the tenor of the chancellor's speech. Why does this wretched and stiff-necked nation not obey these divine sentences? So many and so terrible to which by a vengeance most clearly made manifest obedience is demanded of them. The wretched and stiff-necked nation itself, however, while accepting that God had indeed spoken, was much less certain of what he had actually said. Clearly, the English cause was not just. After all, the English king, king had no lawful right to the throne of France, since claims through the female line had no validity in the most in the most Christian kingdom. And the French had no wish to be his subjects, which made his attempt at conquest an act of unwarranted aggression and his proposed rule a tyranny. The conflict between the two kingdoms would hardly have lasted so long, nor would it have encompassed French successes as well as English ones, had God's judgment been quite so overwhelmingly obvious as the English king was pleased to suggest. The interference of the accursed day of Azincourt, therefore, was not that God supported England's unjust claims. Instead, he had chosen to use England's unjust claims as an instrument with which to punish France for its sins. Oh boy, sin was the heart of the matter. That much was clear. But exactly what sin and committed by whom were questions on which it was more difficult to agree. Perhaps, suggested the chronicle Thomas Basin half a century later, the blessed saints Crispin and Crispian had abandoned the French to the carnage unleashed on their feast day at Azincourt because their town of Socians had been sacked and their shrines plundered only a year before. In the course of the civil war between the Burgundians and the Armagnacs, everyone he said with sorrowful res resignation, can think what they will. For himself, Basin preferred to stick to the facts, leaving the discussion of the arcane workings of the divine will to those who presumed to do so. There were plenty of them. The monk who chronicled the events of 1415 from the Abbey of St. Denis outside the walls of Paris attempted a pass at the same kind of historical humility. I leave it to those who have given the matter careful consideration, he said, to decide if we should attribute the ruin of the kingdom to the French nobility, but he could restrain himself only momentarily from a thunderous verdict of his own. It could hardly be denied that the great were no longer good. The lords of France had fallen into cyberitic luxury, into vanity, and into vice, and their impious abuse of Holy Mother Church, wow, what does that sound like, was matched only by their mortal hatred of each other. <laughs> Oh boy, all these crimes, the Chronicle of St. Denis declared, and others were still, to put it briefly, have justly stirred up the wrath of God against the great men of the kingdom, so that he has taken from them the power to defeat their enemies or even to resist their attack. So I'm going to stop there. It goes on. But let this be a lesson. Um, you know, America... is such a, a lost nation. The whole West is lost really at this point. You know, we think we have this moral high ground and that we're untouchable. And the truth of the matter is, number one, we don't even have a divinely appointed, I guess you can say, government. Like, that's number one. Number two, if, if we humble ourselves a little and look at history, even if you take Christianity out of it, look at the fall of the Roman Empire, the pagan Roman Empire, with all its disgusting filth that led to its deterioration. We are in the exact same position. And if you think for one second, this is what makes me so mad about the West they won't look in the mirror for the most part. The people of the West will not look in the mirror. So we have a bunch of people going around 
just demonizing Putin, you know, not even trying to understand his side of the story, but just demonize, demonize, demonize. Obviously, he's the bad guy. He's crazy. He's a tyrant. But not understanding that it's being allowed to happen for a reason. It's a warning. It's supposed to be shaking us awake. And I don't think it's working. Number one. Number two, you have the, the Catholics, for the most part, all upset and mad that about the consecration of Russia, which again, okay, like whether it happens or not, I'm not even get into. Um, everybody wants a quick fix. That's what it really comes down to. Instant gratification. Oh, just if the Pope just consecrates Russia, everything will be fine. No, it won't. Like it won't be fine. <laughs> like it's not going to be fine without a serious conversion of the people. And that starts at the bottom root level, we are corrupt to our core. It's not only our, our leadership that's corrupt, like in the time of the 100 year war, it's not only the nobles that are corrupt, it's the entire Western society. People are not understanding the magnitude of the situation we find ourselves in. That I can tell you for a fact. And so I just wanted to read that quick little those quick little couple paragraphs just to it's just amazing to me you know what's that saying as much as things change they stay the same um god does use as we can see from history god uses other nations enemy nations to scourge his people that there is nothing new about that that's totally biblical we see that all over king david was a warrior king for a reason right um there's nothing, you know, people are like outraged. How could this be happening? Putin's an evil man, which he probably is. I don't know, but you're missing the bigger point. Don't worry about what Putin's doing. You better be looking in the mirror and worrying about what we're doing. And what we're doing is not good. And the fact of the matter is that these state-run churches, these countries with these state-run churches in these communist countries like China and Russia, um, almost seem at this point to at least on a natural level be living more morally than the West. So that's really terrifying. Um, and the most terrifying part about it is not that we're probably going to about to be in World War Three with nukes, not the bio virus, the bio weapons are about to release. None of that. That's not even that scary to me. What's scary to me is people are walking around like everything's fine. Like, not that we should be panicking or, or anything like that, but, like, there's no processions in the streets. There's no... I mean, there was one in Poland. I did see that. Maybe the Poles will again save Europe, but I doubt it. Um, I don't see a lot of penance. I don't see sackcloth and ashes. I don't see the light bulb going on that we need to change our ways. That I don't see. I see Putin's bad and we should pray to God to stop Putin, but not America and the West is bad and we need to pray to God to show us what we need to fix. That I don't see it being called for. And so that's why I'm really not optimistic about the future. And I know I'm not like a popular person in my little circle of people that I know right now because I'm like a prophet of doom, but I don't know what else to do. Like, and I fear that even being chastised, even with these wars that are coming and everything else that we're still not going to get it. A majority of people will go to their death still not understanding. And that's horrifying. And there's no leadership from the church who should be screaming at the top of their lungs like Father Chris Ayler. Go back and watch that video. That man was visibly upset talking about penance. Penance, penance, penance like we are told to do. Like I just don't get where the disconnect is. Like why are people in such a bubble of such a fog of nothing can happen to us. We're untouchable. Like, I don't know where that attitude comes from. Is that just years of comfort, generations of comfort, generations of brainwashing? I guess so. But man, what is it going to take? I don't understand. Is it going to take a hundred year war like it did for France? Is that what it's going to take? Because I don't, 
I don't think we'll last a hundred years in war with the weapons we now have. So I don't know, I just found that interesting and wanted to share it with you. And that's all, Joan of Arc Media out.